Uh, call to order leg com uh, legislative committee item number one the approval of the committee agenda and work plan. Do you want to take roll? Call? Oh, sorry, take roll. I always forget about taking roll. You'd think a professor would know to remember to call roll, but sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, no no worries. <laughs> Mr. Keeley? Here. Ms. Dillon? Here. Mr. Lawson? Here. Mr. Rosenstill? Here. Uh, Mr. Boykin for State Treasurer? Here. Chairperson uh, Hendricks, you have a quorum. Excellent. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, item one approval of the committee agenda and work plan. So moved. Second. Excellent. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, item number two, approval of the minutes for the July 12th, 2012 Legislative Committee open session. So moved. May I have a second? Second. Excellent. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay? All right. Great. Thanks. All right. Item three, Marianne Ashley, a decision to sponsor state ledge proposals for 2013. Yeah, before she starts, I just wanted to announce to the committee and for the audience that uh, Marianne has been appointed as the permanent director of GAPA. Yeah. I figured I figured one year in an acting capacity was long enough. So. <laughs> So anyway, we're very happy that she's uh, going to be the director, and I'll turn it over to her. Yeah. <laughs> for a statement from the public. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Baker with the California Teachers Association. On behalf of CTA, and I know quite a few um, advocates, we just wanted to uh, thank you for such a great hire, and we are so excited to work with Marianne and her team. <laughs> um, I do want to say thank you. Um, it was about a year ago that I was before this committee for the first time, and I was pretty nervous. And the committee was very kind and supportive, and all the wonderful advocate representatives that I've been able to work with have been extremely <coughs> encouraging and supportive, and the CalSTRS staff as well, and my mentor and boss, Ed. <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm accepting an Oscar, um, but really I appreciate everything that everybody's done and for this opportunity, I am thrilled. I'm so excited I can hardly talk. <laughs> so, but thank you to everyone for all the support and encouragement. I'm glad to have you. Um, so moving on to the proposals that we're recommending this year, there are two. The first one that I'd like to review is a proposal to expand the board's authority over senior management classifications specifically the chief operating officer and the chief financial officer. This is going to sound very familiar to you as it is basically a repeat of the sponsored measure AB 1735 from last year. Uh, Assembly member Wykowski authored that for us. Uh, if you remember, we noted that the financial and investment transactions of public pension systems have more complicated regulatory requirements associated with them, and the requirements just continue to increase in complexity. And as such, the responsibility for risk management and for understanding and managing all the financial and administrative functions of CalSTRS continues to increase. Uh, the most recent independent audit of CalSTRS financial statements identified significant risks surrounding internal controls and material weaknesses in financial reporting. And in response to that audit, CalSTRS completed an organizational assessment that benchmarked organizational structures and positions with the essential competencies needed to manage these increasingly complex fiscal and risk management issues. Uh, the assessment identified a need to create new uh, chief operating officer, which currently uh, we've been titled, we call it the chief of staff position. So it identified the need to create a new CFO and COO positions that would include additional responsibilities as well as intensified standards of financial and operational accountability in order to facilitate risk mitigation and also to improve in managing internal controls. Currently, the board has the authority to establish the competencies and set the compensation for the CEO, the CIO, the system actuary, general counsel, and certain investment officers and portfolio managers. It does not have that authority over the COO and CFO positions. And additionally, uh, recruitment for the COO and the CFO positions is limited to state civil service. 
In accordance with policy, a comprehensive market pay analysis is typically completed every two years, and um, that's for those positions for which the board has authority to set compensation. This uh, upcoming analysis is going to include the COO and CFO positions in recognition of the need for the new enhanced positions, and the results of the analysis will be presented to the Compensation Committee in April of next year. With the recruitment of the COO and the CIO, or COO and CFO limited to the state civil service, CalSTRS ability to attract and, and retain the most highly qualified candidates is incredibly constrained. Very few state agencies have the same broad financial and operational responsibilities that are imposed on a public pension fund with fiduciary duties, and as you know, CalPERS and CalSTRS are the only pension systems in in-state civil service. Um, therefore, the type of experience that's needed to manage the risk associated with the second largest pension fund in the nation is likely to be found uh, from other pension funds or large private sector financial institutions. There are other state agencies that have the authority over COO and CFO positions as well as other positions um, uh, where they can set the compensation in order to attract and retain the most highly qualified candidates as well as to meet the needs of the agency, the state, insur um, state Compensation Insurance Fund and the California Health Benefit Exchange both have authority over the COO and CFO positions. And two years ago, CalPERS was given authority over the CFO position, and it took them about 18 months to actually appoint someone to the position. And the person that they appointed actually came from a pension administrator from Canada a pension administration, administration system from Canada, so um, that benefited them to have that authority. <laughs> Last year, as I noted, the board did sponsor AB 1735, and when it was originally introduced, it was seeking to expand the board's authority over the COO and the CFO positions. Uh, during the policy committee hearings, the bill was amended to include a cap on the uh, compensation that could be paid for the positions. The cap was tied to the governor's salary. And even though the bill passed through the policy committees of both houses without any opposition, it ultimately got held in Senate appropriations with costs um, identified that were linked to the salary cap. Um, Nonetheless, we are still recommending that the board pursue legislation to uh, expand the board's authority over the COO and the CFO positions as there's a need to enhance these positions and add additional responsibilities. Any questions from the committee? So are we, is this an information item, right? Or, or, no, it's an action item. No, okay. you okay. to get sponsorship. Okay. So, a uh, question from Dana. Is Wykowski thinking about, or were we talked with him about uh, authoring it again? Or has he uh, indicated that he would like to do this again for us? He has. I have not spoken with him or his office yet, um, but if the board chooses to authorize seeking legislation, I will go meet with him and, and other members as well. So we would begin seeking, looking for a, an author as soon as possible. Thank you. Mr. Keeley? So I, I, I um, see there's a lot of benefit to being able to pursue this legislation. Um, I see very limited uh, downside mm -hmm. to it because we, we're, not, we're not establishing what the salary would be. The intent of this legislation is it's our belief that the pool of applicants would expand as a result of having the board having the authority to set the compensation. Is that correct? Right, and the positions actually are new positions because additional responsibilities are are added in response to realizing that we have identified weaknesses around financial reporting and that all the requirements continue to increase in, in complexity. Okay. Um, that's, that's all for me. Okay. Any other questions from the committee members? So do I, I need a motion? Move uh, to approve. Oh, 
Mr. Lawson, go I, ahead. I so move. Okay. So move to. Second. Okay. Second. Any other? Any other? So, um, so we vote. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all those in favor say aye. 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 All those um, opposed, nay. All right. Perfect. All right. Thank you. The second proposal is to seek authorization uh, for CalSTRS to provide the annual retirement progress reports electronically in lieu of mailing them unless the members specifically request to continue receiving them by mail. Currently, unless a member uh, states that they only want to receive it electronically, uh, the member will re receive the report via mail and all of the reports are uploaded to my CalSTRS. Uh, CalSTRS contracts with a vendor for the production and mailing of the reports and CalSTRS also uploads all of the reports onto my CalSTRS. These efforts are, are costly and, and they're duplicative. Uh, the cost of producing and mailing the RPR average is about $690,000 a year. That includes the vendor and printing costs. In 2011, CalSTRS uploaded just over 629,000 RPRs to the MyCalSTRS website and mailed approximately 425,000 reports to those members who hadn't requested to just receive the reports electronically. Additionally, there were about 144,000 um, reports that were uploaded but not mailed because CalSTRS didn't have a, a valid mailing address. Um, Members that have created my CalSTRS accounts are able to view the most current RPR as well as previous RPRs dating back to about 2002. Additionally, they're able to receive them about two months earlier than those that received their reports by mail. Having the authority to make the RPR available electronically in lieu of mailing um, would most likely result in uh, a significant decrease in the number of RPRs that were mailed and thus result in su to some cost savings to CalSTRS. Uh, the cost savings are estimated to be between 500 and 700,000 depending on member behavior. And um, the first year there would be some initial costs uh, for system changes. So in the first year those costs might not be fully realized. Um, Staff is recommending that the that the board uh, approve sponsoring this legislation. CalPERS recently included in their uh, mailings that they are going to move to electronic delivery in 2013 unless the member requests to continue receiving them by mail. And uh, according to CalPERS, they don't have a statute that requires them to make the statements available annually. So they didn't need legislation to switch from mailing to electronic submission. They did indicate, though, that they got the idea from Cal Stirs, our bill from a few years ago, our green technology bill. So that was nice. Hey, Marion, can I just add, you, you know, just the other thing that isn't directly related here is, I mean, mentioned is that, you know, we did ask staff to, again, look if there's any other parts of the statutes that are restricting our ability to move into electronic distribution. I mean, I personally, I think this is pretty silly that we have to take up the legislature's time on deciding whether something gets mailed or sent over the internet. Um, but, you know, we've, we've got these administrative details that are in statute that we need to now mo uh, modify. And so we've ended up with uh, administrative practices actually in state laws. Um, but it would be nice, we ran a, had to run a bill to, to do the warrants electronically. Now we're doing a bill here for a retirement report. Obviously, um, it just takes up a lot of cost and time for people to be doing this when they could be working on public policy. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I, I do want to make sure that we have a little flexibility if we identify other practices here that could be that option of being uh, electronified, if that's a word. Um, it'd be nice to do that so we don't keep doing this bill at a time. Great, thank you. So, any questions from the committee members? Oh. Oh, I, uh, Dana? I would move approval. If I have questions, should I? <laughs> second it. No, no. Now I can ask questions? Okay. Or I should grab Michael, actually. Can I? Um, I, 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 I think this, this makes perfect sense, but I guess. Um, uh, 
do we have a sense of what percentage of our current retirees would either opt for mailing or not know that that or just miss it altogether miss the Oh. <laughs> not access the online. Right. Right. Well, one, I want to clarify that we don't send retirement progress reports to retirees. We only send them to active and inactive members. And we don't know what percentage of them would opt um, to re continue to receive it in paper. We do know that when we switched to an electronic only payment stub for those retirees and benefit recipients, who are utilizing direct deposit, that we had about 20% who act, asked for a written copy and the rest did not. Um, I think that's a good message. So, Maybe so conventional so wisdom would tell you that, yeah. that number might have been as much higher than the active group. So I think the uh, cost opportunity here would be quite high if that if we've got a 20% number on retirees. And, and that's the, thank you, because that's the exact point I was going to make. We would expect that the degree of acceptance of electronic information would be higher among the active members than the retired and benefit recipients. Good. Great. Thanks. Well, so, okay. Does the motion to second again? Yeah. Mr. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Healy? So, so, so would this, these savings, would they come primarily from the mail cost and not, not necessarily the loss of jobs or positions for people who actually process uh, these, these, uh, the costs that we projected savings are the printing and the mailing costs, and that work is not actually done by CalSTR staff, that's done by contract. So we would simply not have a contract to print and mail those retirement progress reports. Now, we may um, have an option where those individuals who are requesting to receive a printed copy, we may decide that we can produce those in-house because the volume would be significantly smaller. So that might result in increased workload here, but that decision has yet to be made. We haven't um, yet gotten to what all of the implementation strategy would be for that. But there would be, uh, you know, from, from every estimate that we can come up with, there would be a significant reduction in the printing and postage costs, and those are paid to a third party. And our current year, we're going to cover ninety thousand dollars. About, I think, is the mailing and, and production costs. So it'd be it's saving about 700, it's about seven hundred thousand. Yeah, six hundred ninety thousand. It's like seven hundred thousand. Yeah, and three hundred thousand of it is postage, and the rest of it's printing. Oh, okay, go ahead. So, so as new members come into the system, it would become the the it's practice the will be. The this default is, would be for electronic access. Right. Yes. So anybody on a forward going, wouldn't the decision will already have been made. Yes, but they could still request so to receive it. They, they could still request to receive a, a written the demographics will, copy. copy. are likely that they're not, exactly. they're not going to. Yes. Right. But there would be a state law. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll consume some time on the Capitol. Make Harry, ideally, if you recall <laughs> when we did visioning for Pension Solution and we shared that information with you, one of the aspects of our future vision is at the point of hiring that in addition to signing up for their local health benefits and et cetera, that they sign up for their MyCalSTRS account. So, you know, to that extent, um, members would be trained from day one to go to CalSTRS for vital information. Yeah, that's actually been a thought that I've had is, is in our orientations on our in our districts to have our members be able to, when they do their HR, that they sign up for my counselor is right there. So Love it. It started right, right at the beginning. So we I, want that as well. Absolutely. So that I'm just I'm just kind of working with the savings question that, that Harry brought up. So the other number that kind of shocked me was 144,000 of those progress reports get returned to us. So that's, you know, when you think of the mail and the postage, we'll save on that hopefully so that's good um and then i wanted to ask we'd implement this next would this be for oh i guess legislation so would it be for 2014 or it what would, are we it would take effect january 2014. okay um the, the legislation would take effect january 2014 but that doesn't necessarily require us to implement immediately we're not putting an effective date in there because we also want to look at where we are with our pension solution process it may be that um, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard for us to look away from a potential $500,000 to $700,000 annual savings. That's a big, significant savings. Um, but we also want to make sure that we are prepared for the 
um, memberships awareness and were staffed in customer service to handle the calls and to potentially assist people in the um, registration process for MyCalsters because people will want access to their information and uh, it, you know, it might be something that you don't think about until all of a sudden you realize, I didn't get that this year. Hmm. You know, and, and you start thinking, you know, like, did I get my dentist office postcard reminding me for my six month checkup? Uh, maybe I should have called them and realized it's two years later. I mean, you know, we want, we don't want to prevent people from having access to the information. And we certainly want to launch a member education campaign so that members understand that their information is available to them online. And we would utilize existing uh, communication mechanisms, the um, CalSTRS connections, et cetera. We would use all of our existing newsletters. Uh, we would put an insert similar to what CalPERS is doing for the current year. Um, retirement progress reports are, are annual statements that they're sending out right now um, to let people know ahead of time that this will be electronic only and that they should sign up for their MyCalSTRS account, register for it, that their information is already there and waiting for them. So it's not something that initiates or establishes a MyCalSTRS account. It's something that allows them to access the MyCalSTRS account that is already established for them. And Peggy, when, when members get that email saying your statement is available online, is that my CalSTRS registrants or is it CalSTRS members that get that email? Or how does that? We do two email blasts. The first one goes to individuals who have requested electronic only. So they get the first email blast that says, okay, you requested electronic only um, retirement progress report, they've been posted. Um, and then we follow that up with an email blast to all of the members for whom we have an email address. And we don't have an email address for 100% of our members. I would imagine. Okay. Thanks, Peggy. Got a question from Mr. Wisensteel. Thank you. Yes, it's actually not directly related to, to this proposal, but the 144,000 um, members for whom we don't have a valid mailing address, and we're hoping we're communicating to them by email, but we don't know whether they're getting the information on the MyCalsters website. Um, it sounds kind of surprising to me that there are 144,000 members that we don't know, we don't know how to communicate with. Many of those are inactive members, and we've lost um, our whatever reference point we had for them. Uh, and so they do have a MyCalsters account. That information is available to them. If they contact us, we can provide them with that information. As they approach age 70 and a half, we make a renewed effort to contact them because of the required minimum distribution of their benefits. But there's really no activity that we have associated with those inactive accounts between the time they stop working and the time they're eligible for benefits. Okay. Um, and so the vast majority of those individuals are ones that are inactive and we no longer have a good forwarding address for. We're expecting that they're going to get in touch with us when they want to start collecting everything. Correct. And that we will, be, we will be contacting them as they approach age 70 and a half to, to initiate the required minimum distribution. Except that we don't have an address for them. So. Well, we have mechanisms that we can use to try and find that address, but it's laborious and it's costly. And if it's someone who's going to be in inactive status for the next 20 years, um, it's probably not something that's very cost effective for us to do right now. You know, it may, it may not be worth it for us to contact that 45 year old who won't qualify for any type of a benefit for some time. Okay. Thanks, Peggy. Any other questions from committee members? We have a motion on the table. So the motion is to approve pursuing legislation for this electronic annual statement authorization. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those nay? Opposed say nay. All right. So yes and yes. Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item is informational, so you don't have to take action on it. And it's just a summary of SB 1234 by Senator De Leon. The bill was signed by the governor, and it would provide mechanisms to create the California Secure Choice Retirement Program. And the goal is to provide uh, a supplemental retirement savings program to California's private sector workers who do not have access to retirement plans through their employers. 
The measure establishes the California Secure Choice Retirement Savings Trust and specifies that the trust must be completely self-sustaining and that the funds could only be used to pay benefits to program participants for program administration costs and for program investments. The measure establishes a nine-member governing and oversight board that would be chaired by the state treasurer and also include the state controller, the director of finance, four governor appointees, an assembly appointee, and a senate appointee. And some of the responsibilities of the board would be to annually adopt an investment policy annually declare the stated rate at which interest would be allocated to the program accounts, and they must ensure that there's an insurance annuity or funding mechanism in place at all times that would protect the value of the individual accounts as well as uh, hold the state harmless at all times for uh, any liabilities that were in connection with funding the retirement benefits of the program. The measure also gives the board additional authorities and powers, um, including the authority to contract with CalPERS or other financial and service providers as necessary, as well as to collaborate and confer on the design of the program. Another option that the board would have would be to establish a segregated account, which would be known as the gains and loss reserve account, that would be available to allocate interest to uh, the program when the stated interest rate could not be met by the investment um, earnings. Also, if there was sufficient interest by vendors, the board would have the authority to establish a retirement investments clearinghouse and a vendor registration process that would really be very similar to the 403B compare. The costs of that would have to be borne and shared by the vendors. There are some conditions for program implementation. Prior to implementation, the measure requires that the board conduct a market analysis to uh, determine the viability of the program, and the analysis could only be conducted to the extent that there were funds sufficient to do the analysis and that were made available through nonprofit, private entity, or federal funding. Based on the market analysis, the board would be required to determine if the program was indeed feasible and completely self-sustaining, and they would have to forward their findings to the Director of Finance and other specifi specified legislative committees. Um, additionally, there would have to be sufficient funding for all startup costs that was made available through nonprofit, private entity, federal funding, or a Budget Act appropriation. The program design would have to be in compliance with all IRA and IRC uh, requirements, and it could not be designed in a way that would be treated as an employee benefit plan under ERISA. And also pursuant to implementation, there was a companion bill that was signed, SB 923, that requires subsequent le leg legislation be enacted in order to implement the program. The program design as it's described in the measure is a blend of features that's drawn from different types of plans, including a defined contribution and a cash balance plan. The author's intent is for it to strictly be uh, an IRA program with a guaranteed rate of return um, and operating like an annuity and be designed to maximize participation and be totally portable. The individual's retirement savings benefit would be equal to the balance in the individual's account at the time the benefit becomes payable. There are roles that the employers would have to fulfill. Uh, any eligible employer could voluntarily offer the program to their employees. An eligible employer would have to have five or more employees. And then for those employers that did not have their own um, retirement plan, they would be mandated to offer the program um, to their employees at specified time frames. Otherwise, they would be assessed a fine. Uh, assessed a fine. And employers would have the option at any time to either offer their own employer's uh, sponsored retirement plan in lieu of offering this program to their employees. The eligible employees would automatically be enrolled in the program unless they opted not to participate. 
Open enrollment would have to be offered at least every two years, and again, the employee would be automatically enrolled unless they opted out, and the employees would be given the option to terminate participation at any time. The contributions, the employees would be paying 3% of their annual salary or wages unless they specified otherwise, and the board would be given the authority to adjust the contribution rates to no less than 2% or no more than 4% of wages and salary. Um, employers could make voluntary contributions to employee accounts if they were, again, in compliance with all IRA and IRC requirements and also did not cause the program to be treated as a benefit plan under ERISA. NCPERS has also developed um, a, a proposal they titled theirs the California Secure Choice Retirement Savings Program. NCPERS is currently working with New York on developing a, a similar plan there and they're hoping that other states will uh, again uh, develop plans for their states. Senator De Leon's plan isn't actually modeled um, after the NCPERS plan, according to the senator's staff they called and, and asked that I clarify that. However, the intent and the goal is the same, and that's to provide a reliable, affordable, and completely portable retirement savings plan for those uh, millions of California private sector workers who uh, don't have access to a retirement plan through their employers. Are there any questions from committee members? All right, Grant. Thank you. I was just going to say thanks for the, the report and the update. The only thing that I would add, because the Treasurer's Office has been working with the author's office and soon we'll be working more, not a lot to report yet, but um, the uh, De Leon and his staff are to be commended. They've worked very hard. This is more than just a one-year effort, and it really is, if you People talk about the unfunded liability of the public pension systems and even kind of the wildest estimates pale in comparison to the savings gap between what most people should have saved right now for retirement and what they actually have saved. And if, I think if you look in California, recent reports, the UC Berkeley Labor Center has studied retirement security in California, found that most low and middle income earners are really reliant mainly on Social Security they are going to be able to replace 35 to 45 percent of their income at retirement, which is not enough. And only about half of California employees have access to a plan through their workplace. So it's really a very timely program, but it's probably also a little bit ahead of its time. I don't think it's inconceivable after Tuesday's results that um, that there will be, you know, some possibilities at the federal level to to take a look at this. The idea of automatic IRAs has been on the table. It's been looked at in the last few years. So there's some, some work to do to, in terms of the feasibility study and in terms of getting federal determinations about the program. But um, so anyway, thanks for the report. Yeah, I wonder if the research grant just mentioned. That's really some of the best research we've had done on our state, I thought, in terms of the general population from Berkeley. The study that came out, it was a good conference that was put forth around that and the data is real specific not just about the body of the population but its impact on ethnicity and gender and some of the differential impact of lack of uh, savings on our population there were some real scary findings that came from that the primary researcher on that work was a woman named Nari Gri and uh, she's the person we just hired now she's our principal researcher at the uh, at uh, NIRS in Washington so it's it's great to have the her broader perspectives on retirement security now working on public pension retirement security issues yeah no relation to Michelle no <laughs> <laughs> definitely not <laughs> all right Ms. Dillon Jack did you send that to us at any time I mean, it's actually, it's almost a compendium. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit of research. Maybe it'd be better to get, I could send you the links would be the better way of doing that. Is, I'm sorry. Is it on the NERS website? Or? Her research, I don't think we have it on the NERS one, but I'll send you the, uh, the links to it. Also, you know, if, I don't know if there's time ever in your, in your educational agenda to have, she'd love to come here, I know, and talk to you all on retirement security. So, you know, if you'd like to actually see her present that issue on California, she, I, I'd be happy to ask her to come. Be interesting. You can talk, yeah, yeah, great. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. And again, welcome. Glad to hear. All right, item five, um, Deputy CEO reports. Yeah, the only Ed? thing I just wanted to mention is um, just to alert you in case you, you, you didn't notice it, uh, that on the electronic version of the legislative summary that's at the end of the item that Mary ended on the bill proposals, and we include that at all the meetings, is that the, the bill numbers are now hyperlinked so that if you press on that, it'll actually take you to the Ledge Council site on the bills, and you can see the text of the bill, the votes on the bill, the analyses that the legislature has done on it, uh, and a whole lot of other information, and it's updated. And so the link will stay live. So as they update theirs, if you go to it, it'll automatically update it, update it here. So if you ever want to get more information around a bill that we've identified in this in the summary, just click on the link, and it'll take you to the, Ledge count, the Legislative Council site. So you can see that. Other than that, I have nothing else. To be, other than just to let you know that we are in the process of implementation on AB 340, the pension bill, um, spending a, a considerable amount of time explaining the bill to people as best we understand it. Um, and it's an evolving thing, and we're working closely with the legislature to probably try to clarify some issues that we'll talk a little bit about tomorrow. Great. Thanks, Ed. All right, item six, review for information requests. Jenny? It would be the UC Berkeley link. Great. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, item seven, draft agenda for the next committee meeting. Take a look at that. Do you have to approve that or something? Or? Okay. So moved. Is there any comments? Or? Okay. Uh, opportunities for statements from the public. Anyone from the public want to say anything? Great. All right. So uh, the ledge committee is adjourned.